2020 has brought a bunch of unexpected developments. A global pandemic, the biggest uprising against racism since the 1960s, and rapidly increasing tensions between the world's two major superpowers. But an event last night was even less likely to have appeared on anyone's 2020 bingo. Grammy and Brit Award winning artist Dua Lipa, who made Spotify's fourth most streamed album of all time, tweeted this to her 5.6 million followers on Twitter. So it says, autochonous, adjective of an inhabitant of a place, indigenous rather than descended from migrants or colonists. Uh, most people would have read this, not really, you know, what is going on here? Also, you're looking at that map, what is going on here? Um, a little bit of research. It's Greater Albania. Um, that is what she is referring to. So Greater Albania is, a, is an irredentist concept. It's the idea that Albania should grow to include or expand to include all areas with a majority ethnic Albanian population or which historically had a majority ethnic Albanian population. And we can get up a map now of what that would look like. So these would be the borders of Greater Albania. And you can see why it would be controversial um, because it would not just include Albania, but also parts of Macedonia, parts of Greece, Kosovo, parts of Serbia and parts of Montenegro. Um, so it's a, an ethnic nationalist concept. Ash, I'll go to you first. Um, Dua Lipa and Greater Albania. I mean, I kind of rate it because her, I mean, obviously I don't rate the concept of Greater Albania, but her managers will be fucking screaming at her. They'll be like, why? Why did you tweet this? You know, they probably have an audience, you know, they probably sell records in Greece and Macedonia and, and in these other countries. So for her to just tweet that out to her 5.6 million followers was presumably controversial. Um, your thoughts? I mean, look, call me old fashioned, but I'm not really into ethno states. Um, that's just my position as a leftist. I don't think ethno states are ever progressive. If I have to do a Lloyd Russell uh, Moyle non apology after taking <laughs> that highly controversial opinion, uh, catch me next week. Um, but no, they're not progressive. And I think what this speaks to is two things. One is um, the way in which historical wounds are carried down through the generations. So when you have um, a people which has been fragmented across different national borders because of conflicts, treaties, um, the movement of history, right? There's often a sense that this is a collective trauma because often that, that process has been very traumatic. Uh, and sometimes that, that collective trauma can be wielded for really reactionary and horrible ends. So for instance, after uh, the Treaty of Trianon in which Hungary was carved up after World War I, that's been this kind of nurtured wound, which has also then uh, had an impact on nationalism, even anti-Semitism, xenophobia and racism. It's this idea of we are once strong, proud people tied to this land were, were butchered, right? We were, we were dismembered. Um, when it comes to the existence of a greater Albania, as far as I can tell, the only time in which it has really existed uh, in history was was under Nazi occupation uh, during World War II. So it's something which has, I think, particularly um, horrible origins, even if uh, Dua Lipa, having been shaped by her, uh, you know, parents' experiences as Kosovan refugees, a uh, really horrible impact of trauma, displacement and violence. You might have legitimate reasons to, to feel, you know, quite assertive in her Albanian identity. Um, the map that you see on the flag, uh, when you see an abstracted map like that, you don't really know what kind of landmass it covers. Um, and the first time I saw that flag was when a football match had to be stopped because a drone had flown in with the Greater Albanian flag. And I didn't realize just how much landmass that includes because it doesn't just include uh, Kosovo, but it also includes bits of uh, Northern Macedonia and Greece, um, you know, huge huge areas of land in which you do have diverse populations. Now, I believe in, you know, a, the protected right of a people to self-determination. That's not the same thing as their right to forming an ethno state, regardless of the wishes of the other people who live there. And I actually think, uh, you know, multilingual, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious democracy 
is a value in itself. So yeah, Dua Lipa, bit of a curveball, bit weird. <laughs> not that into it. Not into ethno states. Aaron, what do you make? I mean, to be honest, it seems like a niche. It seems like a surprising thing to to tweet for the con- you know, as a, as a British pop star. But it's not a rare opinion. Um, so I found a poll from 2010 conducted by Gallup. Um, in cooperation with the European Fund for the Balkans. I'm not sure who the European Fund for the Balkans are, but Gallup, obviously a highly rated polling firm. 62% of respondents in Albania, 81% in Kosovo, and 51.9% of respondents in Macedonia supported the formation of a greater Albania. What, what, what do you make of this tweet? Well, I think before we go any further, we need to find out what Rita Ora thinks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, secondly, you know, when, when you said, what's that? I mean, it's quite funny, the tweet... What does the word mean? What is this landmass? What is that national insignia? Who are these two guys? It's like, like none of it is remotely understandable to the average person. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. You're, you're basically asking for a Yugoslav Civil War Mark II. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of crazy. And look, there's a, there's a broader context here, which is about, for instance, Kosovo. You know, there's a good argument to say that Kosovo and Albania could be one country and so on. But irredentism, which is the idea that there is a part of the nation which has yet to be uh, turn back to the kind of, you know, redeem, so to speak, is, a, is a, obviously a very old concept. You get it in Italy before the First World War. Uh, I think that's actually where it comes from, l'Italia irredente. So parts of Dalmatia, for instance, which is modern-day Croatia, uh, were, at, were really parts of it. They're essentially Italian. Now, this concept can go back, you know, very far. We could talk about Greek irredentism would probably have most of northern Turkey, right? Or... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh God, Calais. Yeah. We want Calais back. There's, yeah, there's, uh, you know, you could you could go back. You know, uh, Korean um, irredentism. You might want bits of Manchuria. Indian irredentism. You clearly you might ask for reunification of bank, the Mario Empire. So you go all the way to. to... I'm going to say the modern day Indian economy does not want Bangladesh. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, you go from Herat to Bangladesh, basically, right? So th- yeah. there are there are dozens of countries which have a very feasible, historically, you know, explicable irredentism. But Ash is right. I think what's really interesting about the, the case here of, of Albania is that historically it's been a very marginalised, unique country in Europe. You know, it's I think historically it's it's maybe the only, along with Bosnia, um, they're very rare in being majority Muslim countries in in Europe, and that sort of uh, the amalgam of Yugoslavia brought together countries which were former, formerly from, you know, Christian, from the uh, Austro-Habsburg Empire, uh, with these other countries which historically were part of the Ottoman Empire. And, and so there's a there's a civilizational tension there almost, which makes it a bit different from, say, Italian irredentism. But I think, you know, it, it is interesting that a kind of millennial pop superstar is talking about ethno-nationalism. And I, I do think it's an important point to talk about that a lot of the kind of identity politics... Uh, when we talk about uh, people coming from the global south, you know, um, it can, I don't think it often does, but it can verge into forms of ethno-nationalism. Even the idea around cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is bad. I'm not saying it's a good thing. But, you know, the idea that culture is a fixed thing, which is immutable, that only certain people can perform in certain places. You know, uh, for me personally, I don't see a huge jump between that and ethno-nationalism, or at least you know, not recognizing immediately that ethno nationalism is ethno nationalism is quite a bad thing, uh, and by extension, that uh, you know, we see often with discussions around Israel, people say, "Well, Israel's got the right to self determination." Uh, you know, if we're being serious about you know international protocol, settlers, uh, Jewish settlers have been there en masse since at least the early twentieth century. You, you can you can make a pretty solid argument about that, uh, but then it becomes this kind of id poll thing of historical repression ergo means an ethno state which right now is quite rare you know uh but but i think it's it's becoming quite a salient thing amongst younger people it's kind of like this this thing that's quite that's quite worrying you know we 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 need to have political identities forged on on values and togetherness and meaning rather than the color of your skin or the language that your parents might speak Uh, and it's strange because julia lipper is for me again i might be wrong she's british She's a British Albanian. And so if you're asking for an ethno state, be careful because then you're not going to last here very long. Uh, I think it is in, in many ways actually expressing some quite important political conversations we've got to have on the left. Ash. I don't know. Do you, if, do you um, see a straight line between cultural appropriation or concerns about cultural appropriation and ethnic nationalism? Um, no, not necessarily. I don't necessarily see that link. But what I do think um, 
uh, is true. And I was wondering if you'd agree with this, Aaron, is that sometimes when you have people who live in the diaspora um, and they're, you know, that one stage removed from their heritage culture than their parents, mm. maybe two steps removed. Mm. You do find sometimes people of our generation, our age group and younger going for really reactionary ideologies yeah. Yeah. as a way of feeling closer to a culture, a place, a way of being yeah. that they're fundamentally really, really distant from. Um, I remember when I was at school, for instance, uh, there was a girl in my class who, uh, you know, she had Hindutva everything. Like, you know, you know, those like clear big art folders that you had to take in. It was like, Hindutva branding, like, and, you know, she had that kind of, you know, very funny mix of like, you know, uh, bourgeois Indian Hindutva, but also kind of like entrepreneurial go get a spirit, like kind of mainlining Reaganism. <laughs> she's, she's a really funny girl. Um, but it's that kind of looking for a meaning and a history, which has very contemporary, uh, you know, potentially very violent and very oppressive consequences but because you're that one step distance from it you you're a little bit I don't want to be patronizing to anyone but you're a bit ignorant you're a bit ignorant of its full consequences your parents and your grandparents are the ones you had to live with the nuance they're the ones who had mm. to live with the facts that nations are diverse and you might feel really strongly about an ethno state but actually your neighbor is Serbian and they're ill and you take them there shopping every week and you don't actually want to see them kicked out right we all have to exist in the gray area um where where there aren't these hard and fast rules but when you're that generation removed you can look back and turn things up to high contrast I'm not sure I'm expressing it well but do you know what no, I mean it's a generational thing I think it's a really important point you're making something that Ash and I share that you, sadly you don't have with us Michael is that you know we have you know we're we have um with the descendants of people who weren't from here. And so for people in Britain in the 21st century, you know, it's about forging a meaningful identity that allows us to be happy and, and live well. Uh, and I think I think that's a really important conversation again for the left to have, you know. And I think often there's this bizarre, vacuous, insipid thing about, oh, you know, Englishness or Britishness. I mean, I'm not I'm not into that. I don't like it. But clearly, you know, we, we live in this political entity, which is actually incredibly mixed and diverse and i wonder what kinds of togetherness we can forge in the 21st century to me that's a more appealing political project than you know some faraway ethno state that actually I, I think if anything appealing to that is a reflection of alienation right mm. the, 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 i think that by necessity appealing to some abstract ethno state from a place you're not even living in i think reflects a, a feeling of unease at the same time in the place that you are living in uh, and so i think for people of mixed heritage I think for people who, who whose parents are from other places, I can understand why that's appealing, the Hindu for stuff and so on. Uh, but I, I don't think it I don't think it's going to help anyone. I don't think it's a particularly nice way to live. I don't think you'll be particularly happy doing it generally. Uh, but I do think there's a project there for people on the left to talk about coming together and forms of collectivity in the here and now, which aren't a reflection of alienation, but actually the opposite.